Hey, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us here at Hawk Ridge Systems for our first ever live stream event. We're super excited to present to you the top 10 design tips that we think you should know. This is a continuation of the night school events that we typically put on live in person several times per year. These are educational sessions where we we'll come out and present to you different topics on engineering, whether that's design, simulation, 3D printing, manufacturing like CAM, and so on. These are fun sessions for us to put on, and some of the best stuff is the interactions that we have with you. So we'd encourage you to participate using the, um, the chat pane on the right hand of your screen. I've got a couple of colleagues that are manning that, and will be taking notes and answering your questions and actually feeding them back to us to present to the rest of the group. I'd also really urge you to subscribe to our channel. We put out several videos per week on a wide range of topics, and our goal there is to educate and inform you of different engineering topics and technologies that are available. So today, I've got an agenda that we're going to cover. And fortunately, we're about halfway through the introductions. We've got three different sections that we'll be, um, we'll be going through. The first one is on user interface tips and tricks, as, long as, as well as a couple of other things. We've got a section, about a 20-minute section, on working with imported models, and a section on uh, working with large assemblies and improving the performance there. And then we'll conclude with um, some closing remarks. Now, we did plan this session originally to be 60 minutes. In fact, the email invitation was 60 minutes, but we just couldn't cut enough of it out to fit that time frame. So we're going to be a little bit over. We're geared towards 90 minutes today. But we will be recording this. It'll be uh, available for you to review and watch much later on. Um, so feel free to duck out if you have to. But if you're going to join us, we're going to be a little bit longer because we've got more content that we could strip back. So with me today, I've got a couple of my colleagues, two of our top engineers to present to you these top 10 tricks and tips. So with me, I have Jacob Ames and Ryan Navarro. Now Jacob's out of Seattle and Ryan's out of Massachusetts and I'm here in Minneapolis, probably spread out in the same way that you're working today as well. So first up, Jacob Ames. Now Jacob comes to us with a degree in mechanical engineering and aeronautics from MIT. That's right, MIT. Uh, today he focuses on CAD modeling, simulation, technical documentation, as well as some 3D printing stuff. Uh, he spends his time delivering product demonstrations, training new and existing users how to get the most out of these tools, and he's gonna share a lot of that expertise with you today. He also builds content for our YouTube channel and blog. He's created some of the most popular videos on our channel by tackling traps for new players in a fun and entertaining way. So I'd urge you to take a look at some of Jacob's work. It's really great. I'm proud to introduce you to Jacob Ames. Hey, thank you, Tim. Uh, just want to say I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. Uh, my section is going to be on the user interface and some productivity tips. And I chose this section because I wanted to make sure that we included some content for everybody. Whether you're a brand new SolidWorks user or you've been using the, the software for 20 plus years, like I'm sure some of you out there have been, we wanted to include some nice ways to uh, to streamline your workflow. So I'm gonna be looking at uh, user interface as well as some configurations and display state techniques that are gonna be worth taking a look at. Oh, good stuff. Also with us is Ryan Navarro. Now Ryan's also a degreed mechanical engineer and an avid SolidWorks user since about 2007. Ryan today focuses on complex modeling, uh, workflow consultation, as well as simulation. And he's one of the most knowledgeable engineers I've met. Maybe you've seen one of Ryan's videos, or if you've ever been to the annual conference, you've been lucky enough to sit in on one of his sessions. You must have got there early because they tend to be standing room only. Ryan's somebody I personally go to often when I'm looking for advice on some topic inside, uh, inside CAD or, or even engineering in general. I'm super ex excited to introduce you to Ryan Navarro. Ryan, can you tell us about your section? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I'm really excited to be here on YouTube Live, so this is great. Uh, I'm going to be talking about direct editing and model import settings. So basically anything pertaining to having to work with non-native CAD data inside of SOLIDWORKS. Uh, why'd you choose that topic, Ryan? Well, I think it's something that pretty much all of our users have had to deal with at one point. And if you haven't, you probably will when uh, you know, you're know you maybe trying to source a purchased part online and the only thing available is a step file or uh, collaborating with the client using another CAD tool. So. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings around what you can and can't do with those imported files. So hopefully I can clear some of that up. Oh, looks good. Should be fun. And I'm Tim Newton. I've uh, been in the SolidWorks um, world since 2001, and it's been a super fun ride. I've been able to touch on a lot of the different softwares and add-in technologies that are available. 
And, um, you know, that experience, is, it's, it's really been rewarding to present folks like you different topics that are so beneficial to you. Uh, today, I manage a group of product specialists. So these are some of the um, brightest folks in niche areas of the software, such as CFD or fluid dynamics, structural simulation, electrical engineering topics like schematics for systems or PCB, um, as well as technical publications that allow companies to create that content, those work instructions or assembly manuals concurrently with the design process, saving time uh, and leveraging the CAD model. So today I'm gonna to present to you uh, 20 minutes on assembly performance, which is something I've done with customers time and time again. Uh, I hope to get you all of that value in a condensed period. In fact, all of our um, topics are, are really information dense. There's a lot of, lot of tips, a lot of things to be aware of. So guys, we, we, we put something together. Can one of you tell a little bit about what we've got for uh, the audience today? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we put together a guide that basically condenses everything that we're going to be presenting today into what, about 36 pages. I promise it's lots of pictures, so there's not too much reading, but uh, whether you're looking for my tips and tricks or Ryan's direct editing strategies, uh, Tim's assembly performance uh, tips and tricks there, uh, we have all of it down below. So take a look in the description and uh, you can get access to that guide. Really valuable learning resource for the future. Right, so don't waste too much time trying to take the notes. We put the notes together for you and you can download them from the link below. Um, we're also gonna do a giveaway. We've got a 3D connection space mouse that we're gonna give away to one lucky registrant, but you do have to register in order to be uh, eligible for that drawing. So again, down in the description is a link to the registration. If you got here through some other way and you're not registered, no big deal, go ahead and fill that out, that'll be live. Uh, and then after the session today, we'll draw a winner and then we'll contact you if you've won. So if you've always wanted to try one of those out, maybe today's your lucky day and you could win one. So Jacob. Yes. Tips and tricks on the UI. I've been using SOLIDWORKS for nearly 20 years now. I hope you've got some stuff for me too. Yeah, we certainly do. And, and again, that's why I chose this section because it's got something for everybody. Uh, some of these in fact are tips and tricks that I've just learned in recent months. So with our training program, I often find myself learning new things from our students. I like to think they learn as much from me as I do from them, uh, but I'm really happy to and excited to show you what we've got uh, here for you. So the first thing that we're gonna be looking at is how to customize your workflow. This is gonna be an overview of the user interface and how to customize things like keyboard shortcuts, mouse gestures, and other time-saving techniques. So we'll show you some of our favorites, and then we're also gonna show you how to set up your own. Because of course, you want your workstation to, to be yours and, you, and yours alone. So then we're gonna take a look at display states. Some of you out there are probably already familiar with display states, but for those of you who aren't, it's basically like a visual configuration for your model. So we'll show you how to create some of those and leverage them to the best of your ability. And then we're gonna finish off by taking a look at configurations. So there's a number of different ways to create configurations. Many of you are probably familiar with the manual mode for this, but uh, we're gonna show you how to do that a little bit faster in a table format. So we're gonna jump right into SOLIDWORKS and get to it. And I'm not gonna waste any time at all here. So we're gonna introduce you to my personal favorite shortcut, and that's the tab key for hiding and showing components. Now, this also works for multi-body parts, which is what I have here. I designed uh, a water bottle that I actually have sitting here on my desk, and it's a multi-body part. So if this were an assembly, the same behavior would be true. You can hover over a component or a body and press the tab key to hide it. So it really is that simple. And this will give us a nice look to the inside of the bottle. If I hide the band here, you'll also be able to see the threads that I built into it. Now to get these components back, you do the same thing that you hold shift while you press the tab key. Hover over where a component used to be and then hold shift and press that tab key. Now the key here is that you do have to be hovering where the component used to exist. If you're out here in white space, you're gonna notice that shift tab doesn't do anything. So this is the first shortcut that I actually learned just recently. Shout out to Nicholas Hagar if you're watching. He taught me this in one of my training classes. If you hold the control key and shift and tab at the same time, what do you notice? It'll actually highlight all those components so that you don't have to guess where they're located. And just like before, you can click to reveal those. So this really helps manage your, your visibility of your components and uh, see exactly what you need to see. Now, the next tip that I want to introduce, we're going to jump right into a sketch because I want to create a revolved lip for the top of this bottle. And one of the easiest ways to get into a sketch, a new sketch, is to simply right click one of the default planes in the Feature Manager Design Tree. You can also do this with any visible flat face in the graphics area. Give that a right click. I find myself constantly using these context menus. My right click menus, I can go straight to a new sketch. 
the next step here in most cases is we're going we're gonna to want to go normal to this sketch, meaning looking straight at it. My favorite hotkey for this is Control 8, but you can also customize your right click menu to include this command. We're going to get started with a line, specifically a construction line. I'm going to activate the line command with the L key on the keyboard. That's a pretty common shortcut. Most of you probably know this. But did you also know that you can actually modify the options in the property manager by holding the Alt key and pressing the underlined character of the option that you want to toggle? In this case, if I want this to be a construction line, notice the C key or the C character is underlined. I can hold down the Alt key and press C on the keyboard to toggle that option on or off. And this makes for uh, really fast changes to options and, of course, activating commands while minimizing mouse movement. So this is one of my favorite techniques. I'm gonna draw another line here that's gonna be our axis of revolution. And then I wanna add in a quick symmetric relation. So I'll make my selections here. If you recall, I mentioned the context menus, one of the key feedback options that I like to use. Now, if you notice by my cursor, we have this transparent menu. If I move away from this, it disappears. But if I move toward it, all these icons represent things I can do. In this case, add a symmetric relation. I could start commands from here, add in dimensions so on and so forth. So I like to use those mouse gest or uh, rather those mouse feedback menus as frequently as I can. Now to get back to my original view, I could go normal again, or I'd like to introduce the previous view command. You can activate this from the heads up display toolbar or use the command control shift Z. And it's like an undo button for your camera. So it'll, it'll actually cycle through previous views, allowing you to get right back to the orientation that you were in originally without having to do too much extra work. So that one's pretty helpful. Uh, I'm going to access the mouse gesture wheel for my next command. And I do this by right clicking and dragging. You drag your cursor just a little bit while holding the right mouse button down. And then to activate a command, you can just slide through it. Just move your cursor through it. And that's fully customizable. It's context sensitive. So depending on the mode of SOLIDWORKS that you're in, you're going to get different uh, results. And you can customize those, of course. And then I'm going to grab a corner rectangle. As I'm sketching it, you'll notice that I have some boxes that are available. And this is one of the options that I like to turn on right away uh, as soon as I install SOLIDWORKS because it's not on by default. This allows me to type in dimensions as I'm sketching so that I don't have to come back with the Smart Dimension tool later on. Uh, and I do want to take just a second to show you where this option is, in addition to another option that will allow me to automatically rotate my view normal to a sketch when I create or edit one. So let's go take a quick look at our system options here. When I go into system options, obviously there's a lot of categories here. The two, the two options that I was referring to are in the sketch category. The first checkbox, auto rotate view normal to sketch plane on sketch creation and edit. This is what will allow you to uh, basically avoid having to use that normal command. As soon as you edit or create a sketch, it does that for you. And then the second one, enable on-screen numeric input on entity creation. This is what allows you to input those dimensions directly. Now, even if you've been using the software for many years, there are a lot of options to dig through in this menu. So I wanted to point out additionally that we have a search options toolbar at the top right of this dialog. If you know any term of the option that you're searching for, like numeric in this case, you can use the results to navigate directly to those options and they'll be highlighted so you can quickly turn them on or off. So I encourage you to use that when you're looking for options. Hey, Jacob, this is Ryan here, and I have a quick sure. question for you. Um, I know many users, when they, they're creating sketches on different faces or planes, they may run into a situation where uh, the origin is twisted and horizontal is actually looks like it's vertical and vertical looks like it's horizontal. Do you have any way, sure. uh, suggestions for users to handle that? Yeah, there's, so there's a couple different solutions to that depending on what you're trying to do. And if it's just a matter of manipulating the view, my recommendation personally is to hold down the Alt key and use the left or right arrow keys to roll your view. And this does this without model rotation. So you're still looking normal to the plane, uh, but you can reorient this accordingly. And the reason I like the keyboard shortcut for this is because it, it rolls the view in increments of 15 degrees, which is in many cases very convenient. You can do the same thing by holding Alt and center clicking and dragging like you would do a rotation, uh, but that doesn't have that increment. Now, if you wanted to actually redefine the origin, meaning what is horizontal and what's vertical, you can actually use the tools dropdown, go to sketch tools and take a look at the modify option. Uh, we won't get into this, but it's definitely a tool worth researching if you find that uh, your, your orientation of your sketch is backwards, it allows you to change that. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. 
So let's go right into a revolved feature for this. I'm going to go ahead and click my axis of revolution. And what I want to point out here is my cursor. If you look closely at my cursor, you'll see a green check mark on the right mouse button icon. Uh, I love these. These allow you to complete commands without having to go over to the check mark. There's other cases where this will also allow you to advance to the next checkbox if you have a more complex property manager. So we'll be using that again here shortly. Next up, I want to hide a couple of these components because we're going to add in a fillet. And I'm going to access this command by using the S key on the keyboard. S is in SAM. When you use this, you'll get a shortcut menu. And similar to the mouse gesture wheel, this is context sensitive. So in this case, I'm getting features. If I was in sketch mode, I would be getting sketch tools. And I can simply start up a fillet, no problem. I'll give that the proper size and select an edge here. And we'll go ahead and complete that. That S key is probably, it might not be my absolute favorite, but it's certainly one of them. And I think I use it more than anything else. All right, now let's say I wanted to make an adjustment to this fillet. Uh, this can be problematic if I don't know the name of that feature, for example. This is fillet 62. I've got a whole bunch of other features here that I've categorized in folders to make things easier. But if I didn't know the name of this, I wouldn't be able to search for it. Uh, I, if I couldn't find it in the feature manager, what do I do? Well, in 2016, we introduced the idea of breadcrumbs. If I select any visible vertex, edge, or face in my model, you can see an abbreviated version of the Feature Manager design tree appear in the graphics area. I can right-click any of these icons and use the context menu, which I brought up earlier, to edit features, or in the case of features that have sketches applied, those are available too. And a simple right-click will allow me to edit those features and sketches without needing to really know anything about the feature. All right, we're going to add in another fillet here, uh, but I want to show one other thing that it's one of the first things that I teach people in our essentials class for SOLIDWORKS Basics. Take a look at the top right of my screen. Notice I can search for commands here. Now, by default, this may be set to SOLIDWORKS Help on your system. To search for commands, use the drop down next to that magnifying glass and click on Commands. I can then type in the name of any feature that I'm interested in. In this case, maybe a delete face command. This is one that Ryan's going to be talking about in his section on direct editing. Now I have a few options here. I can click the result to start the command. I can click on the eyeball if I'd like to locate the command. This will actually open up menus and switch tabs if necessary to show me where this command lives. Or my personal favorite, you can actually drag and drop these results directly onto your command manager for what I would consider to be probably the fastest version of customizing your user interface. So next time I need delete face, I can go right to it there from my features tab. So we're not actually going to use that delete face command, but I always like to point out the fact that you can search for commands. Now, next up, I'm going to use the S key once again to add in another fillet. This will be a full round fillet. And notice when I click on my first face, I need to click on a second face after advancing the selection box. And I can do this with a simple right click. So rather than completing the command that advances the box, I make my second selection and right click, and then my third and final selection. And then you'll notice the check mark on the cursor once again that will finish that command off. And then next up, if I want to recall that, that fillet command and use it again, I can press the Enter key. Now, if you've done a bunch of stuff in between, this might not work. But if you just finished a command and want to reuse it, the Enter key is a really good idea there. So we'll do the same thing. And we'll finish that feature up with a right click. And we've got our finished fillet. Hey, Jacob. Sure. Tim. Yeah, I just wanted to interject with a piece of advice I was given from a crafty user one time with regard to fillets and chamfers. And what they told me was that, you really want to be careful when you're placing fillets and chamfers. Don't cut any corners. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that in most cases, but that's really what we're here to do, right? Uh, we're not cheating. We're just cutting corners and trying to operate as quickly as we can. So uh, I do appreciate that advice, though. Um, and that does actually remind me, uh, as of 2017, maybe some of you are already familiar with this, but you can convert any fillet directly to a chamfer with a simple right click. So that's a pretty cool piece of advice there. Same thing works in reverse. So you can convert chamfers into fillets as well. So pretty interesting stuff there. All right, so that's the majority of the keyboard shortcuts and, and shortcuts in general that I wanted to show. But we need to talk about customization, right? So how do we actually control these keyboard shortcuts? And how do we make adjustments to the user interface? And where I typically go from here, there's a couple of different ways to do this. But using the Tools drop down, if you scroll to the bottom, and you may have to click this down arrow a couple times in order to see. Uh, but we're looking for Customize. 
And customize brings up a dialogue that allows you to adjust all sorts of stuff about the user interface. But what we've talked about so far is the shortcut bars tab uh, and then commands, keyboard and mouse gestures. So let's take a quick look at those. From the shortcut bars tab, uh, you can see the results of our S key. So this is where you customize what the S key will display. These buttons here allow you to toggle which mode you're making adjustments to. So here we have sketch mode, features mode, et cetera. And you can use the drop down to look for different categories of commands. So in this case, maybe features. If I want to add a loft to this dialog, I can just left click and drag, drop it into that menu. And if there's anything you want to remove, just click and drag it off the menu. And then you can also, of course, resize this for a different shape. Okay, so that's really helpful. The commands tab is really useful for browsing through these commands. And this is where I'll typically go if I'm trying to add a command to the feature manager. So let's say I wanted to add, uh, we've already got a draft icon, but let's say we didn't. You could drag and drop that right onto the command manager. And likewise, you can drag anything off of the command manager if I wanted to remove delete face, for example. You can also, while this dialog is active, toggle between tabs. And uh, I have a lot of add-ins and other programs, so I've got lots of tabs here. But at the far right, you have the option of creating a new tab as well if you want to create one of your own. Then keyboard. This allows you to modify and take a look at any existing keyboard shortcuts. You can see there's many commands that don't come with keyboard shortcuts. So you can adjust those. You can use the drop down here to show all your commands with keyboard shortcuts. And if you want to get rid, rid of any of them or reassign them, just click in the cell that says shortcuts. You want to use backspace here to clear out the shortcuts. Otherwise, if you use delete, it'll actually assign that as the key. And then you can use the keyboard combination you want to assign. And I like to show the commands with keyboard shortcuts because you can actually print this list. This is especially helpful if you're a newer user and you want to get familiar with those keyboard shortcuts. And then finally, mouse gestures. Again, context sensitive. So we have our four different mouse gesture wheels here. And you can drag and drop commands directly onto those wheels. Also worth mentioning, this particular tab has a search for box. So you can search for the command you want to add. You can disable mouse gestures, though I would discourage that. I know some of you don't like mouse gestures, and that's fine. Uh, but give them a try. I think you'll really like them. You can also adjust how many gestures are shown on each wheel. So really nice, easy way to customize your user interface and make things go a little bit faster for you. And that's really our goal here is to, to make things more efficient, regardless of what you're designing or how you're designing. So we're going to move on to display states here in just a second. But uh, Ryan and Tim, I wanted to ask, as far as shortcuts, we've covered a lot here. But do you have any additional or, or favorites that you would like to, to add to this list? I do, Jacob, I do. Uh, and like you, I learned this, uh, well, this was from a colleague, not a student, but Andy taught me one time a way to go between the different sketch modes for the sketch tools. So for example, if you go sure. into a sketch and pick up the rectangle tool, I think there's five ways to sketch a rectangle in SolidWorks these days. Sure, yeah, to you go can between see that those, on my feed here. Yeah, there we go. To go between those modes, instead of um, clicking on them, if you use the A key on your keyboard, A is an apple, you'll toggle between those. I, I didn't Perfect. know that for years, and I don't know that that's documented anywhere either. So It might be somewhere in the keyboard shortcuts list. It might be worth taking a look at. But yeah, that's an interesting one that I, I didn't know until now. Uh, you can switch between those with the A key. That's awesome. So yeah, no, I, for the different modes. If somebody out there is listening and you've got a favorite shortcut, we'd sure like to hear about it in the chat. So would everybody else. So take advantage of that. Let us know your favorite shortcut. Yeah, definitely. I'd be more than happy to take a look at some of those. All right, moving on, we're going to take a look at display states. And again, for those of you who aren't familiar with display states, they're similar to a configuration, but they focus on the visual properties of a model. So typically, these are used for changing things like colors and appearances, but we can take them a lot further than that. So I wanted to bring this up. Uh, and let's say we wanted to create a new appearance. Now, as I go to select some faces, what do I notice? Some of you have seen this before. This is one of my highest rated YouTube videos. Uh, everybody runs into this problem. Notice my cursor has that filter icon on it. What is that? That's actually a selection filter, in this case, preventing me from selecting anything except vertices. Now, sometimes it might limit you to faces, sometimes edges. And when this comes up, it can be kind of difficult to figure out how to remove it. I've had customers completely shut down their computer only to come back and find that this is still turned on. The easiest way to clear this is with the F6 key on the keyboard. That will clear that, that selection filter out for you. Um, alternatively, if you prefer, you can press F5 on the keyboard, and that will show you all the selection filters that are available. And there is a time and place to use selection filters, so I encourage you to do a bit of research on them. But in most cases, we just want to clear all those filters out so we can get back to selecting as we had originally intended. 
So let's say I'm getting ready to apply an appearance. I'm gonna grab some faces here. Maybe I select 10, 20, 100 faces that I'm getting ready to apply an appearance for. And then what happens? This has happened to everybody. You click in white space and all of your selections disappear. So what do you do at this point? Panic, maybe just go home for the day, right? No, you don't have to do that. You can right click in the graphics area. And if you look closely, Right here, there's a symbol for previous selection. And this is an important one because this is difficult to find anywhere else. So you need to find it in the context menu here. And you click on previous selection, that'll restore everything that you just spent so much time selecting and you'll be back and on your merry way. So I encourage you to take a look at that as well. That's the previous selection button. So I'm actually gonna jump into my appearances dialog here to drop in a blue appearance. Uh, before I do that, though, of course, we need to get back to the task at hand. Let me undo that because we want to create a new display state. So let's get rid of this for just a moment. Display states are actually created in the configuration manager, presumably because of how similar they are. You can right click in the dialog here and add a display state and it'll automate it. So there's no property manager to work with. It just creates a new display state. At this point, when I add any appearances, they're going to be contained to this display state and they won't affect the original one. So now we'll come back into our appearances, drop that into the body there. Maybe we wanna add a second one to the handle, drop that in. And then when we go back to display state one, you'll notice that the colors are gone. So this is a really clever way, easy way to use display states, but we can take it a lot further than that. So let's add one more display state. This one's gonna have the blue colors, but we're going to make some further adjustments. If you come back to the feature manager design tree, provided that it's not too narrow, if you have a real narrow design tree, you won't see this, but if you look at the top right, we have an arrow here. This will, will show the display pane. And what this does is a quick and easy way to adjust things like visibility, display style, and this is going from left to right. We have columns representing these, visibility, display style, appearance, number three, and then finally transparency. Now, if you're in assembly, then all of your components will have icons represented in these columns. In the case of a multi-body part like I'm working with, I actually have to expand my solid bodies folder and then let's say I wanted to hide the handle. I can just click that icon, that'll disappear. Let's say the cap, I wanna change the display style to hidden lines removed so that I can still see the profile, but it, you know, it lacks detail. And then maybe for the top, I wanna to make that transparent, right? You can save all of these directly to a display state. So if I go back, I can switch back to my original display state and see everything. Now for a real quick toggle, this actually applies to both display states and configurations. You wanna consider going to the view dropdown, going to toolbars and turning on both configurations. And then, you know, if you prefer display states is here as well. So you have some quick toggles so that you can refer uh, to your different display states and configurations. So that's a little quick crash course on display states. Uh, I hope you like it. And these really go hand in hand with configurations. So this is the last piece of my section before we move on to Ryan here. And Everybody's probably familiar with the traditional way of creating configurations, right? You right click, you add a configuration, you give it a name, set your, your properties, and then you can make adjustments to feature suppression states or dimensions, so on and so forth. But I'd like to offer you a faster way to do this. If you go to the feature manager design tree and you find either a feature that you want to adjust or if they're visible on the screen, you can do this with dimensions. You'll simply right click on a feature and choose configure feature. This will open up a table dialog. And from here, you can add any additional features by simply double clicking in the feature manager design tree or the graphics area. As long as they're visible, you can also bring in dimensions. Uh, and if not, you can always activate dimensions using the drop down by the name of the features in the header of these columns. So you can build this table like this, and then you'll notice there's some texture that says creates a new configuration. You can simply click in this, type in a name, and it'll automate a new configuration for you. And then you can just make adjustments to these suppression boxes and these dimensions. So I've actually already created some here. Um, so we'll go take a look at those in a moment. But I wanted to point out that at this point, when you click OK, these configurations will be created, but you'll lose the table. So if you want to save the table for future use, you want to make sure to click where it says Enter Name and type something in. So I give a name like Config Table, click this Save button, and then this will be stored in the Configuration Manager for future use. So super quick and easy way to generate those configurations. I know that's my preferred method. Uh, and in the configuration manager here, you'll see the tables folder where I can always bring that table back because I saved it. And then the three configurations that I generated. So we can go take a look at those. Here's my 275 millimeter standard version of this. 
Uh, when you do create these configurations, they're not loaded automatically, so you will have to, to load them. But here's the simple version. I've got a professional version that's a little bit longer with the rubber band on the top. And then my third configuration is this premium version that has all of the above, but it's a little bit bigger and it's got our logo on it. So really convenient way to generate configurations. Now, a common question here is how does this compare to a design table? Some of you are probably familiar with design tables. This is sort of a middle of the road, right? So it, it's faster than the traditional manual way of creating configurations, but it doesn't have the power of, of an actual design table. So, and that's kind of nice sometimes. If a design table is overkill, uh, or if you find them difficult to use for any reason, you can use the configuration table to, to simplify this process. All right, so that is my section. Just to do a real quick recap here, we talked about customizing your workflow, how to add keyboard shortcuts, uh, change mouse gestures, things like that, add commands to the command manager, and talked about some of our favorites. Again, I know this was a very quick section, so just as a quick reminder, we do have that guide available in the description. I encourage you to check that out. I've documented everything that I've talked about in this section in that guide. We talked about display states, how to create and use them, as well as the configuration table for light speed configurations. Hey, great stuff, Jacob. Quick question from the chat pane, AR Hockey 25 asks, is it possible to save the customization? Uh, and then use that on some other system. Could you show us how to do that? Yes, that's a really good question. So, and that's actually something that we have to do as engineers here because we have different settings for events like this versus training versus demonstrations. So the easiest way to do this, if you wanna take a look at the screen here, uh, the home tab on the, the task pane over on the right hand side of the screen, if you open this up, we have a copy settings wizard. And this copy settings wizard will take a snapshot of everything that you've customized, all your keyboard shortcuts, all the commands that you've added, uh, even things like color schemes, if you adjust those, and it'll save that to a file. And you can take that file with you wherever you'd like so that you can extract those settings to uh, whatever PC you like. Uh, now, another way to do this is uh, with the advent of online licensing. A couple years ago, we introduced online licensing for SOLIDWORKS, which means that you get your own account and uh, you can actually set that up so that wherever you log in to SOLIDWORKS, those settings will follow you. So I encourage you to check that out. But definitely my default, at least for right now, is that copy settings wizard. And that's a great question because you don't want to lose all that hard work you put into customizing. No, definitely not. Hey, a couple other things from the chat window. A few favorite shortcuts. There's G for the, modify, the magnifying glass. So sure. for those of yep. you listening in, yeah, there you go. That zooms you right in. Yep. I like that. You can still make selections on this. So that's a really good one without having to zoom everything in. Uh, you just reminded me of another one, but we'll see if anybody how, else- How's it go away, it. Jacob? How's, how do you get, oh, there you go. I like to use escape. You can use it, the G key again if you'd like, but escape removes you from pretty much everything. And then one other favorite shortcut is the A to automatically transition into the R command at the end of a line. I definitely should have seen that one coming. Let's do a real quick demonstration of that. This one's nice, especially if you use the enable on-screen numeric input. So to give you an example, if I'm sketching out a line, um, I can use the A key to automatically transition that into a tangent arc, but notice what's happening to me, right? If I press the A key, it's trying to add that in as a dimension. So if you're not using on-screen numeric input like this, A key is awesome. If you're not, though, what I would recommend, there's a graphical way to do this. You can move your cursor back to the endpoint and just hover over it for a second. And then as you move your cursor away, that'll automatically transition as well. So something to keep in mind, I'm actually glad that got brought up uh, because it can be a little bit confusing if you're used to the A key and then you enable numeric input. Uh, so great tip, good to keep in mind. Awesome. Well, that was a fantastic section, uh, Jacob. I mean, that was packed full of a whole bunch of tips. So check out the handout below to get a comprehensive uh, overview of all of that stuff. I know I'm going to use the uh, configuration table a little bit. I've used the design table historically, but a lot of times I'm not using all those advanced functions. That looks simple and, and convenient. Yep. All right. Well, we'll talk to you in just a little bit. Up next, uh, we have Ryan Navarro, and Ryan's going to take us through a section on importing. Um, Ryan? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, and again, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, I think importing models is something everyone has to deal with. But as I mentioned, there's some confusion a lot of times over what you can do with an imported body and you know what requires having a SOLIDWORKS native feature tree um, and also how to repair issues with those files. So that's something we want to look at here. And basically, the main topics I'm going to cover, import settings, the major ones to be aware of, 
uh, most notably 3D interconnect, which is one of our newer import options. You can toggle on or off. How to repair geometry, diagnose geometry, and find out if it has any faults, and then fix those how to compare different versions of imported files to see what's different. And then also uh, how to modify those files. So this is gonna focus on direct editing, how to modify parts that don't have a feature tree and aren't dependent on them. And I know, again, we're blasting through these features. So uh, I realized I probably have hours worth of content that I could talk about. So you can probably expect in the future some more YouTube videos on this topic from me. Um, but we're gonna try to show you just the most high impact ones now. And again, there's that guide you can download in the description and this recording to come back through once again. So let's go ahead and jump into the software here. And I'm gonna open up a Parasolid file. So not many options I'm gonna talk about on this one. I'm just gonna open it up. And the very first thing I wanna point out is that once it's open, you're gonna get a prompt for import diagnostics. And this is something that pretty much always, universally, I encourage users to click yes, because it's gonna check the quality of our import for us. Hey Ryan, real quick, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to jump in. I've seen dialogues like this in many cases where there's a checkbox that allows you to dismiss it, and then you can't get it back, or it doesn't show up again. So my question, I guess, is really two parts. A, can we get those dialogues back? And then B, if I, if I have that dismissed and I can't, how do I get back into import diagnostics? Yeah, great question. Because if you do click that, don't ask me again, checkbox and click no, you'll basically never see this prompt again until you go back into your system options like Jacob was in earlier. Um, and there's a setting in there that I call basically the messages graveyard. It's the messages errors warnings section. So if you go there, you'll see all the dis messages that you've dismissed over the months or years here. And if you click the checkbox, then you'll get that back again the next time you do something that would initiate that prompt. So yeah, great question. Uh, oh, yeah. Another way to get in there is you can just right click on the imported body and you should have access to the import diagnostics that way. So I can get back in there and import diagnostics is gonna recognize faulty faces and these can cause downstream issues if you're building features on top of the imported part uh, and also gaps between faces, which is what we found here. So if I click on that, it'll highlight for me the open areas of this part. And even if we didn't use import diagnostics, we should be able to tell that there's a problem here because of these blue edges, which in SOLIDWORKS in the system colors represent open edges on a surface. So this is a relatively common issue uh, when you do have an import issue, because what I expected here was to have a solid part. And either due to export problems or import problems, I ended up with a surface body that has some kind of gap that needs to be patched or filled in. So I can easily do this with the attempt to heal all button in import diagnostics, which is gonna try to patch those faces. You do wanna check and make sure because it needs to kind of guess at the geometry it's filling in. So it can change the result slightly. So you just wanna validate that that's what you wanted for it to heal. Uh, and then even if you do have remaining faulty faces here, you can actually run that subsequent times. So I've had good luck sometimes running it too mostly two or even three times sometimes to heal all the issues in a part file. If there's anything really stubborn that won't heal with just those methods, then you'll have to fall back to more manual like surface modeling tools to repair those. So that's import diagnostics and you really wanna run that up front because once you build up additional features in your tree, you can't run import diagnostics. It has to be run when the imported bodies are the only features. You can also access it through the evaluate tab right here and this is next to some of my other favorite geometry comparison or validation tools like the check function. So this will basically check the model similar to import diagnostics did and show you if you have any faulty faces or anything. So you can use this during your modeling process if you want, but it also enables you to specify a check for short edges. So here I'm just gonna check for any edges below a certain value and check, and then it's gonna highlight those for me. So these are things that I might not otherwise be able to notice. And these can be due to artifacts in the export or just tiny little features that I may not need in my model, like this little tiny cutout. So it puts that nice big obvious yellow arrow there for me to see. And then I wanna remove this little chunk. So I'm gonna do that using the direct editing features in SOLIDWORKS. So this is a direct editing tab that you can turn on. If you right click underneath your command manager and go into the tabs there, uh, you need to right click a tab of the command manager actually and then you'll be able to choose that option for direct editing. 
and you can see some of the different commands we'll be using. So I'm going to use the delete face command, and basically just by selecting all these faces here and running delete face, when it's in the delete and patch mode, what it does is it looks at these surrounding surfaces and tries to extend them to fill in that gap. So it's basically going to restore this back to a sharp corner as if that cutout wasn't there. Uh, the other most popular feature we talk about when we talk about direct editing is the move face command. So this would allow me to, for instance, move this slot if I want to select all those faces, and it doesn't need to be all of them, then I can run the move face command. And this lets me drag either with the on-screen triad to position this where I want it to be. Uh, I'm in the translate mode right now of the move face command, by the way. So I can free drag that with the triad using the on-screen ruler or I can type in a precise value down here or use end conditions like in your extrudes up to vertex, up to surface, up to body. So I was able to translate that entire slot. And even though we call these direct edits in SOLIDWORKS, there basically is still some parametrics and feature history to them. So I can roll back before these direct edit features and see the changes there. Um, and I can also access the dimensions associated with them. So with Instant 3D, for instance, I can free drag these dimensions. You could also link those dimensions to parameters like a global variable or equation if you wanted to. So let's suppose that I want to also shrink the back of this part and move that back face up. I could do a new move face command there. Uh, or in this case, I'll just edit the existing move face command and make sure that I'm able to offset that. So I'll come in here under translate, click that back face, and you'll see that it will change the result slightly. So it's actually ditching the chamfer and restoring that to kind of a flat face. So this is one of the troubles with move face command. You have to be very careful about your selections. If I want to keep that chamfer, then I also need to include that, and it's going to pull that face over as well. So with this, we've essentially shortened the part a half an inch. Now. I want to also stretch this slot out. And I just want to show a different workflow for that. So I'm going to create a plane uh, just by offsetting. I'm using some of the shortcuts Jacob introduced there. Offsetting a plane where I want to split the part. And then I'm going to run this split command on my direct editing tab. And this does just what it sounds like. It allows you to cut the part either into two halves or multiple pieces. So when I click cut part, then I need to either select the bodies or click the little check marks on the scissors here to specify to cut them. And uh, I can even specify a file to save these if I want to split these up and save them as separate part files in a what we call master modeling workflow. But I'm just going to click the check mark. And essentially, what was one solid body before has now become two solid bodies in the uh, feature tree here. The reason I'm doing this is so I can use the move copy bodies command. So I can basically select one of these chunks and either translate or rotate that. You could even pattern or copy it if you want to. And then I've created a gap, so I can just use regular SOLIDWORKS modeling commands to fill this in. I can do a sketch, convert entities, and extrude up to next to merge this back in with the other piece. And I'm using some keyboard shortcuts and things there again, like Jacob introduced. So uh, that's a technique called splitting and bridging. And those are things that we talk about in our advanced part modeling class, if you're interested in learning more about those. Now, I've shown a lot of stuff that happens to work great, but you've probably tried out some of these commands if you have delete face, move face, and people usually get pretty frustrated <laughs> the first time they try them uh, because of a couple of things. One is how important the face selection is. Uh, so if we wanna try to move something, like say this face that has chamfers and fillets around it, and I select the move face command there, if I try to translate that, you're going to see that it might do some unexpected things, like it's extending the chamfers around. The preview doesn't make a whole lot of sense compared to what I would want it to be. If I need to come in here and select additional faces, and then I can translate a little bit closer, but you get past a certain point and the preview will disappear, indicating that it's not going to be able to translate that. Um, so really, if I want to move this whole thing, I need to move all the chamfers and fillets and everything together as essentially a unit to be able to accomplish that. So once I select everything in there, then I should be able to offset that entire shape. Ryan, that's pretty great. Uh, I've got a challenge for you, though. I mm -hmm. work with a lot of molders, and they're faced with putting draft on imported models. So that vertical face that you initially clicked there, 
could you put some draft to walk us through how to put draft on there? Because as I see it, you'd need to adjust the fillets and the chain. That one move would, would affect a number of faces. Can direct right. editing tools do that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so what Tim's talking about is if I were to select this here, all these other faces also have to move and they'd all need to get tilted or rotated to be drafted a certain amount. And just trying to do all that with one move face command um, is a little much to ask of it because it doesn't, it's not necessarily gonna know what to do with these other arcs and fillets here. So my approach there would generally be to try to simplify the model first before making those modifications. And one of the ways we can do that is with the delete face command, which is great for simplifying the model. So I can try to delete these chamfers and when I have them selected there, again, that delete and patch mode is gonna try to restore them back to sharp corners. And I can basically choose all these faces here to uh, restore all those back to a sharp corner. Now I would have need to measure them ahead of time. So for instance, I can click on this fillet and look down in my uh, status bar to see the radius of it and then run the delete face command on that. I probably could have done it in the same feature, but I can strip these features off, make a simpler geometry that then I could either add a draft feature or I can use the move face command and use it in its rotate mode uh, and specify an axis. You can free drag with the triad or here I'd wanna specify an axis to establish either positive or negative draft around. Um, then you can add those chamfers and fillets back in. So since I measured things, I can go right back into my fillet toolbar and just input whatever value was supposed to be there for the chamfer or fillet and reapply the chamfers. So you're gonna make some friends with that great. functionality, Ryan. That is powerful stuff. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I should point out that the other limiting factor with these move faces is the, the quality and information stored in the surrounding surfaces. So, um, you know, if the surrounding surfaces aren't clean or they have faulty faces, like you didn't run import diagnostics, then you're going to see really poor behavior out of these tools. Uh, but one other thing I want to mention while we're here is a lot of people assume that, say I were to get a version two of this part, the vendor sends me a new revision, a lot of people assume that I'm basically stuck and I'll have to recreate all these features that I created on the new version, right? But that's not entirely true because you can actually edit the imported body just like you edit any other feature and browse out for a replacement file. Now, there is a disclaimer here. I'm not saying this is gonna work perfectly, uh, but it'll try its best to map over those references. So if I browse out, I actually don't have a replacement file here to choose from. We could choose a replacement file, match the faces and edges, and it'll do the best job it can to try to maintain your downstream features and map that over to the new revision. Another thing to think about is if you do get sent a new revision, you might want to know what's changed about it or even just figure out if it is a different model or not. So I wanted to talk about some comparison tools here. And the couple you have available to you, Geometry Compare, is included in all versions of SOLIDWORKS. And uh, it basically allows you to compare two solid bodies and visualize either the material that needs to be added or the material that needs to be removed between them. So uh, you can use this on imported files. They do have to be SOLIDWORKS parts, so you just have to import them and save them first, and then use this to figure out the differences between parts. Uh, this is accessible under the Tools pull-down menu and compare geometry. And there's other options in there too, like compare features if you do happen to be working on a native SOLIDWORKS part file. So this is included in all versions of SOLIDWORKS. There's a new function called body compare that I'm pretty excited about. This is for SOLIDWORKS 2020 and newer versions. And this one works by comparing two bodies within the same part file. So basically you have to insert both bodies into one part like here, I use the insert part command to do that. Um, and then you can compare them. You'll get this nice heat map up on the screen of the differences. And the reason I get excited about this is because the other tool can just compare solid bodies. This can compare arbitrary body types. So for instance, you can compare a surface to a solid, surfaces to surfaces, and so on. And you can even compare against mesh files. So a STL file, like from a 3D scan or 3D print, so I think anyone that does reverse engineering uh, would be pretty excited about this feature. And that's in all versions of SOLIDWORKS 2020. But there's a lot more I wanna talk about regarding importing. So I'm gonna do my best to get through this quickly here. Let's open up another file and it's gonna be a step file this time. One of the most common neutral file formats. So 
I'm gonna choose here options. Now this options button gets overlooked pretty frequently, but when you click that, it's gonna basically pop up your system options to the appropriate tab, the import tab. And I'm gonna have some options pertaining to this particular file type. So for step files, we can turn on what we wanna import, auto healing options, uh, some assembly import options. If you click through, you basically wanna check out all your different file types and, and make sure that your options are set based on what you want. The main one I wanna show you is under general tab. And this is where you can enable or disable 3D interconnect. So uh, that was added in 2017 and it allows things like natively importing uh, other CAD files. So if you have Inventor, Creo, Solid Edge files and you wanna use them in a SolidWorks assembly, for instance, you can insert those files right into a SolidWorks assembly without having to actually save a SolidWorks copy of them. So that's one of the big benefits. And the other benefit is it maintains an active reference back to that file. So you can basically collaborate with people using other CAD tools. If the file updates, it'll update inside your SolidWorks also. But it does change some things with the import. So I just wanna show that you can toggle it on or off here if you wanna try out the legacy importer. So I'm gonna show what happens with 3D Interconnect on. I'm sure a lot of you are probably used to it by now. Uh, and open up step file. Now this also happens to be more of a sheet metal part. So I still get the prompt for import diagnostics here, but you can see the icon through the import looks a little bit different because 3D Interconnect uh, for 2018 was expanded to include STEP and IGIS. So basically by default, these files are gonna import with 3D Interconnect. If I run my import diagnostics, like I tell everyone to do here, then we're gonna see we don't have any issues on this file, but I also don't have the ability to attempt to heal. So this file that's inserted is basically maintaining an active reference back to that step file, as we can see by the little external reference indicator in SOLIDWORKS. And uh, that can be great. I can build features on top of it and it will automatically update if there's a revision. But if I do need to heal the geometry for some reason, then I'd wanna dissolve that link. I can just right click on the file, dissolve feature. In assemblies, you'll have this option at the top level also. Uh, and break the link. So you get a warning. Once you do this, there's no going back. But this dissolves it and turns it back into the imported body like we saw before. Then you can right click, run your import diagnostics, and you'd have the healing capability there. Because again, we don't want to build on top of faulty faces if they exist. Now, on a sheet metal file, there's a couple different tricks I want to show you here. So one is let's ditch one of these notches. I'm going to select it use the delete face command and patch that away as if it was never there. And then let's suppose I want more instances of these. So I can actually pattern. If you notice, pattern is on my direct editing toolbar. So we might not think of it as a direct editing feature normally, but linear and circular patterns support uh, patterning by faces. So I can choose here under features and faces, choose the faces I want to pattern, and then select that loop. It's the order I should have gone in. And it's basically gonna to try to pattern those directly. So I can input whatever spacing I want here. And this is useful even in regular modeling workflow because it opens up possibilities like patterning just one instance of something created in a feature that might've had maybe multiple holes. So uh, you can pattern faces with the linear pattern command. And there's more I wanna show you, but I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit just to show you what you can do here. Uh, I was even able to offset this jog in the sheet metal bend. And I did this by using the move face command in its rotate mode. So if we look here, that bend was originally a little bit more shallow. Then I specified an axis and did the move face command using rotate options to basically rotate all these faces down an extra 10 degrees, specified about that axis and then just create another axis after that's performed. So very easy, go into your reference geometry axis and select that face to have that show up uh, and then bend it back the other way. So pretty neat. And the one thing we didn't talk about is changing the size of features yet. And that's what happens when you use move face in the offset mode. So let's suppose I want to enlarge or shrink a feature, then I can select those faces and offset and whatever offset value I type in, it's gonna to try to either shrink that geometry or enlarge it if I flip the direction. So I can enlarge or shrink down whatever things I want. I can even apply it to the entire thickness of the part if I select tangency to select all the outer faces and then do a move face offset 
that's going to offset the entire thickness of the part. And I can use that to grow or shrink the wall thickness. And since we have instant 3D, we should be able to even dynamically adjust that if we want to, to, to reduce or increase it. Now, I know a sheet metal part that can't flatten isn't terribly useful to a lot of people. So when you're working with imported files, if it's a sheet metal part and you want to generate a flat pattern, the easiest way to do that, in my opinion, is to go to the sheet metal tab and use the insert bends command. So this is basically a command that all you need to do is choose a fixed face from a solid body, specify your bend radius and relief settings, click the check mark, and SOLIDWORKS is gonna try to process those bends for you. So we can see here a flatten bends command with all the individual bends listed out underneath, and then processing those bends back into the formed 3D state. Now I have a flat pattern that's accessible at any point with bend lines, so I can send this out to DXF or WaterJet or however it's gonna be manufactured. So insert bend commands for converting imported sheet metal parts into flattenable sheet metal parts inside SOLIDWORKS. So just to recap here a little bit, we talked about import settings. Notably, you can toggle that 3D interconnect on or off if you wanna try the legacy importer. And if you wanna heal geometry, you may need to dissolve the feature there. Always run import diagnostics if you can. It just takes a couple seconds and it will identify if there's any issues in there like faulty faces that you just don't want to build on top of. Uh, you can also use the geometry compare tools to compare different versions of an imported file. And then the direct editing tools that we talked about. So move face command, delete face, patterning, uh, splitting and moving bodies and bridging them back together. Again, I'm excited to continue talking more about this topic in the future, uh, but this is kind of the crash course to get everybody started, hopefully. No, that's awesome, Ryan. I, I can't believe those changes you made to that jog on that sheet metal part. I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people would even imagine that you could make those kinds of changes using direct editing tools. Your, your ability to kind of recognize the geometry, you know, the types of faces, and, the, and then use those, is, it's really powerful. Good job. Um, nice. We did have a question. I know you're scanning through the chat, mm -hmm. um, and there's been some good stuff coming in. This is, this is probably one of the most fun presentations I've done in a long, long time. I really appreciate all the interactions. One of the conversations that takes place in the chat is about um, conversions going back and forth to China and translation. Now, I know SolidWorks just put up the beta program very recently, and it is under NDA, so I can't talk much about the actual features or functions that are in there yet, but it's, it's online, and I think there might be something that's worth looking, there, looking at there. Um, you can find that you know, on the SolidWorks website. If you've got a SolidWorks login, you can get at that. There's even an online trial that makes it tremendously easy to get at. Um, that next version of SOLIDWORKS and try it out without, you know, installing or anything like that. Super handy. Great. Ryan, we had another question come through that I actually thought was really important because, as you mentioned, the success of an import kind of depends on the origin of the file, right? Yep. So the question was based on, and this is based on neutral format files, uh, your STEP, your IGIS, your Parasolid, what order would you sort of rank them in, in terms of if I have access and I can get multiple copies, what's my best chance of success? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, so when in doubt, I would just say STEP file as the most kind of universally established. Uh, but there is an exception to that, which is SOLIDWORKS uses the Parasolid kernel. So that Parasolid file I opened initially, you might have noticed it just kind of opened in a snap and didn't require any translation. Um, so if you're going from a Parasolid modeler to a Parasolid modeler, then the Parasolid file would actually be my first choice. So um, for instance, if you're saving to send to someone that has an older version of SOLIDWORKS that just wants to see an imported body or something or a new, newer version and you don't want to provide the intellectual property of your feature tree to them, Parasolid would be the way to go. Um, but if you're not sure what CAD system it's coming from, then I generally see the best success with STEM. Perfect. Thanks, Ryan. Awesome. Well, Ryan, I really appreciate um, you know, your section there. It's been fantastic. And up next, I'm going to share some thoughts about large assembly performance. Awesome. So this is a broad topic. Um, in fact, I've spent you know, quite a few days out at customers working through their large assemblies, and it tends to be a couple of day process to actually you know, make all the changes. So I'm going to try to give you everything that, that I've learned over the years in about 20 minutes. Now, I've got three sections that we're going to cover. First, symptoms and causes. I'll teach you about some of the reasons and ways that your model might be slowed down. 
um, some diagnostic tools that allow you to identify the reasons or the location of the uh, slowdowns. And then lastly, some of the performance enhancing modes that you can utilize, that you can put to work without much effort, let SolidWorks do some of the heavy lifting. Through some simplification, you can see some pretty significant performance improvements using these modes. So let's dive into the common symptoms. I just have three of them, it's pretty easy. First off is load time, uh, as well as saving time. So this tends to be a bandwidth issue. Now, if you're working on the home, uh, at the home office today using a VPN, it might be the, your internet speed, could be your network speed, but basically it amounts to pushing large amounts of data down small pipes. So some ways that you can investigate this, well, one is um, you know, PDM systems just work this way. When you check files out, they move locally, and when you check them back in, they go back to the network. So basically it does all of this stuff for you automatically. Now, if you don't have PDM, simple test is you can just move those files to your hard drive, work on them, try them out, and um, you know, see if it's the network that's bottlenecking everything. Otherwise, there's some techniques with reducing file size that may help improve that. And I'll show you how to locate these and how to fix them um, in a live session here in just a moment. Next up, we have rebuild performance. Uh, and that's rebuilding the assembly. So that includes the mates, assembly level components, like planes, axes, linear circular patterns, that kind of stuff, as well as in-context features. Now, sometimes there's a bit of a misconception I've heard from users that they believe when you rebuild the assembly, you're rebuilding all of the features inside all of the parts. And Well, this isn't true. Um, when you rebuild the assembly, the only time you're rebuilding features inside the part is if you have uh, in-context features and dependent features in there. So that's something you probably don't need to look at. Most likely, it's something inside the assembly a lot of times it's the mates, and oftentimes we'll reduce the number of top-level mates through the use of sub-assemblies. Uh, and a quick test that you can do is you can just turn the mates off and see if your rebuild performance comes back. Flexible sub-assemblies can also affect this, and I'll show you how to find those too. And lastly, we have view manipulation. So if you've got a large model and you're doing dynamic view manipulations, maybe you win that new 3D connection space mouse and you're rotating things around and it's doing the ka-chunk, ka-chunk deal, uh, well, you need to look at the display. So this could be the graphics, the number of graphics triangles. SolidWorks approximates the geometry that you precisely model in there through the use of triangles. So a cylinder is represented through number of triangles, and the more triangles, the more accurate that representation can be. Um, so there's some ways that we can locate and then reduce the graphics triangles to bring back that performance. Now this all assumes that you're using modern systems. If you're using this uh, world's first PC invented by IBM in 1981, I can confidently tell you that five megahertz processor is not up to the task. So in that handout uh, that we've mentioned numerous times now is two of our hardware recommendation guides. So these are guides we update every single year for the version of SolidWorks as well as any new hardware advances. Um, you, in there you can see the systems that we're actually running today and issuing to our engineers as well as recommendations based on applications. So if you're a heavy simulation user, uh, or a heavy rendering user, there's some different considerations that you'd want to make. So check out the hardware guide for up-to-date recommendations. Next up, diagnostic tools. So to locate these problems, there's one tool I primarily use, and that's performance evaluation. In here, this dialog box contains a number of uh, pieces of information that lead me to the components and the causes of the slowdown. So I'll show you that live uh, in just a second. Another related tool is assembly visualization. This can present some of the same information as the performance evaluation, but it does it in a more graphical way. Uh, with this tool, you can colorize your model based on mass is a good example, where maybe the heaviest components in the design show in red and the lightest show in a blue color. You can also set this up to use performance metrics like number of graphics triangle, open time, and et cetera. So the last thing I want to share in PowerPoint before we actually get into SolidWorks and do some stuff are some of the different performance enhancing modes and SOLIDWORKS has been adding to these um, incrementally every single release. So large design review mode was added a few years ago and that's the best way to open a model fast. Uh, limited capabilities in terms of what you can do but it is the fastest way to get that model open. If you're doing a design review in the boardroom, check out this way to uh, please your boss and get that model open quick. Next up you have lightweight. Lightweight's been around for a long time and is a great compromise between performance and capabilities. If you're struggling with large assembly mode, please try that mode out. Even if you've tried it before, come back to it. Uh, it's been enhanced, the capabilities have been extended, and it's, it's better than ever. You have large assembly mode, which is a collection of settings that can be triggered by opening an assembly with some 
number of components beyond a threshold you can customize. I'll show you how. You have Speed Pack, which is the lightest weight version of uh, assembly through the use of a configuration. And finally, if you're detailing, you're doing drawings of this kind of stuff, check out detailing mode. What that enables you to do is work without loading up the model. Basically, the line art saved in the drawing, and you can go ahead and add dimensions, annotations, right from this detailing mode without needing to load the model. All right, so here in SolidWorks, let's take a look at some of the ways that we can uh, improve large assembly performance. So using the open dialog box here, the recent document, I can actually click this little arrow, whoops, and that can open up the assembly for me. So let's go ahead and have a look at that. Now, sometimes in a presentation, you get a little fat fingered, and that's exactly what I just did there. So let's go back to that document. Here's a shortcut for you, Jacob, R for the recent documents list. That's right, that's one of, my, one of my favorites too. I've got a lot of favorites, but that's definitely up there. I didn't intend to show that one, but sometimes mistakes cause, uh, cause us to learn a little bit more. So in here, I can select from different modes of opening. Now, maybe, you know, I'm kind of old school. I still use Control O to open, Control S to save. Um, and in here, I can browse around. There's a couple of shortcuts I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, first off is the filter top level assemblies. So with this filter, all we're left revealing are the top level items. Now, if I hold my cursor over that for just a moment, it'll actually inference and give me some additional information about the opening time for this document. You can see the last time we opened this fully resolved, it took nearly 40 seconds. While using lightweight, it only took two seconds. So you can kind of see how significant uh, a time savings that you could realize by using lightweight mode. Down here are the different modes of opening from slowest to fastest. Like I said, I really recommend lightweight mode. Now, today, in this environment, uh, I want to open this up as fast as possible, so we're going to use that large design review mode. And this was developed as a mode initially to just review, although there are now some editing capabilities. But you see how fast that opens. From there, I can rotate the model, I can look at stuff. The dynamic inferencing works. Oftentimes, I'll open a larger model only to identify the sub-assembly or component I actually wanted to work on. Perfect use case here. So you can see how that inferences, I can also right click to actually open that up. You've got tools like measure, section, snapshots, all there to, um, to actually review that design. And then right clicking at the top level, I have options to edit the assembly, set it to lightweight, or set it to resolved. Now Ryan, I know you're a big lightweight user. Can you just give us some comments on why you choose to use that mode? Yeah, so well, well that's go in there. Um, I just wanted to add kind of another vote for lightweight mode. It's, it's basically my go-to because it's the closest thing to no compromise, in my opinion, between the performance and the utility. So uh, there's limitations, but they're not too common to run into. Like in context edit, components can't be lightweight. But even then, SolidWorks will automatically resolve those for you. So if nothing else, I'd encourage everybody to try out uh, lightweight mode if you're working on moderately or larger assemblies. Yeah, one of the things you, you can't actually see into the feature manager tree, right? But when you're putting parts into an assembly, that might not be important at all. And like Ryan said, you can always right click to make things lightweight or set them back. Um, it's true, if you work on a 5,000 part assembly, I doubt you're touching all 5,000 5, of those parts in a day and making changes to them. So lightweight's a great way to go. And Tim, um, if I could, if I hey, could jump ahead. in just with a comment on large design review, maybe you already touched on this, but that can be a really good way to open up a top level assembly when your goal is actually just to look for a sub assembly. Right? Exactly. So you have to load the entire thing just to open another sub assembly. I don't remember what that part number is. I need to see it. Yeah, uh, exactly. good, good use case, totally. Now, I actually resolved everything. And the reason I did is I wanted to make you aware that in order to get accurate numbers from performance evaluation, you do at some point need to resolve those part models. So typically I'll work through some of the smaller uh, sub-assemblies and then work my way up to the top level. So I'm, I'm fixing things down at that level and then realizing those performance benefits as I move up. So here's the performance evaluation. And in here I see a list of the components um, that are taking a long time to open in the open performance area. Now, these parts aren't taking very long, but if they were, I'd use this little open dialog box to open that up and investigate the causes. Um, oh, there's a question from the audience about the easiest way to open a uh, lightweight assembly from the PDM vault. 
Um, basically, you can browse right into the PDM vault using the open dialog box, and that same slider that I showcased there is available. So just browse in using the open dialog box, select on your assembly, and then look to the lower left-hand corner of the open dialog box for a slider that you can move to lightweight. There's information about previous versions of the files. Now, uh, prior to 2020, if you opened up, say, a 2018 version in 2019, behind the scenes, SolidWorks was converting that file in to the latest version. And if you didn't save it, you'd have that same performance hit every time you worked with that file. So we'd recommend folks actually use a file version upgrade and upgrade the versions of their files to maximize performance. But as of 2020, um, that performance uh, hit has really gone away. It's not really a thing. From my testing, uh, they open nearly as fast as native version files. Next up, we have graphics performance, so display performance stuff. And here we can find this ball bearing that shows up well, almost 100 times in my model and is taking 9 million triangles to display. So that's 9 million more than the next uh, amount, of, largest amount of triangles for this roller that shows up many, many times in my assembly. And what's kind of ironic is you couldn't see that ball bearing. It's about a one inch OD ball bearing. Couldn't even see it from here. So it's taxing my system for something I can't see. So let's go and investigate that. We're gonna use the open dialog box. And after reviewing the rest of the information here in performance eval, um, we'll go in and make a fix to that. There's information about appearance. Ryan, did you know that uh, applying many appearances to files can affect the performance? Yeah, and actually that's something I should have brought up in my import section because step files and other imported files can have a whole lot of appearances on them that can end up bogging down performance if you're reusing those in assemblies. Here yep, we can yep. look at the rebuild. Oh, I was just, I was oh, just go gonna say, Tim, uh, another thing to consider with respect to appearances is, especially for sub-assemblies, consider using display states. That's exactly what they're uh, really powerful for. Oh yeah, so basically what you're saying is I make a simplified display state without all those appearances that I use in my assembly, maybe while I'm constructing it, and if I need to show all that stuff, we just switch the display states and there's all the detail. Exactly. Very cool. Here you can see the mate, uh, per, the rebuild performance, and in this assembly, it's rebuilding almost 180 mates every time it rebuilds, which is many more mates than I actually placed into this assembly. So flexible sub-assemblies cause um, performance hits when it comes to solving the mates. Jacob, I know you did a video on flexible sub-assemblies. If anybody's interested in seeing how to use them, can you just tell us what it is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the video that I did was actually about how to turn it on. Uh, because the idea behind a flexible sub-assembly is that you can see all the internal movement within that sub-assembly. Whereas when you normally insert sub-assemblies, they come in like components. They come in rigid. Uh, that being said, as cool as the flexible sub-assemblies are, uh, they can have a bit of, of a performance impact. So something to be aware of. Yeah, so actually, if you just reminded me about those videos, if you, if you want to get more videos like that, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Like I said, two times a week, we pump those out, and our goal is to inform and educate you on a wide variety of engineering topics. So mate performance. Um, in, in fact, the reason for the high, high number of mates here is because I've got a flexible subassembly. So I'm going to show you a way to find those and then toggle them back to rigid. We also recommend you minimize top-level mates through the use of subassemblies. This also makes it easier to edit. Say you've got a mate error, well, what are you going to do? You've got 180 mates to review. That, that gets challenging. Lots of sub-assemblies improve performance and makes it easier for you to edit. Here we see information about the performance settings. Now, this assembly is about 2,300 parts, which is well beyond our 500 component threshold. So it's actually activated large assembly settings, which is a collection of settings I'll show you in a moment. And finally, we've got some summary information about you know, the total number of components, unique parts, mates, so on and so forth. So here's this bearing that we opened up that was, um, you know, to display the 99 copies, took 9 million triangles. So under settings and the document properties specifically is your image quality slider. So this governs that level of detail. You notice if we make that low, uh, circles become facetized or look like octagons. And, and over here, it takes a tremendous amount of triangles to make a very precise circle. So somewhere in here, there's gonna be a, a, you know, a nice compromise between view and performance. So let's go ahead and put it right there. Now you'll notice, you might be able to actually see that. I, I'm okay with that. Um, in most cases, it's fine. If I wanna do a rendering, I might crank that up at the end. But while I'm working on the assembly, I like to reap the benefits of extreme performance through the use of um, you know, low image quality. I can also do some simplifications. While these balls in the bearing look realistic, 
couldn't even see the bearing from that perspective of the large assembly. So I might create a simplified representation in a configuration and actually go in and suppress those balls out of there. Now, if mass properties are important, of course, you can assign them. Maybe this is a shielded ball bearing and we'd never see those anyway. Um, so there we go. We just simplified. We fixed our display issues through one, adjusting the display quality, and through uh, two, through making a simplified representation. Okay, back to the assembly. Now, in the assembly, there's some options here I also want to make you aware. You can control that level of detail slider at the assembly level, and if you have this option, select to apply that to reference documents, that will save that to the reference documents. So a while back, I did a rendering, and I wanted the quality to be really good, so I ripped the slider to the right, and then I wound up saving some of those files. And it wasn't until a little while later where I understood why those components had that abnormally high level of detail setting. It was, well, self-inflicted. Under system options and uh, assemblies, you've got this section here about large assembly performance. Here's the threshold. And once past the threshold, these are options you can employ. My personal favorite is to have it disable auto recover, hide the planes, axes, reference geometry, as well as hide the uh, edges. Now I know I've got a colleague who doesn't like the edges to be hidden. Right? Less edges mean less taxing on the graphics card, but you can just switch that off and it won't do that anymore. Or maybe you want to take advantage of some of the other tools there. All right, next up are flexible sub-assemblies. So I want to find that in the tree. And you know I can visually look through the tree, but that gets really hard, especially when there's lots of components. It gets blown out. Oh, there it is. I found it. It's got the little icon, but that's a lot of work. Let me show you a simpler way. Come up here to the, uh, to the filter and then just type in flexible and it will filter for anything flexible. So that enables me to select that and turn it back to rigid. So we stop solving those mates. It stops the movement, but reclaims my assembly performance. All right, so just like that, we made a couple of great fixes. You know, we cut 9 million triangles out of the uh, graphics job. Card's gonna thank us for that. And we've also reduced the top of mates by over 100 mates by toggling off that flexible subassembly. Curious in the chat if anybody knew about that option to filter and search for flexible subassemblies. Let me know. Now, I've blown out my feature manager tree. Lots of the things are expanded. Quick tip sh uh, control, sorry, shift C will collapse. That's shift and the letter C will collapse that feature manager tree. I see users often clicking the little uh, arrows to collapse those, so don't do that. Just you know, shift C, make it happen. Okay, a few last topics I've got for you is uh, one of these assemblies, this four meter conveyor section, this shows up all over this design. And when I have a component like that, I might want to invest a little bit in terms of simplification so that when I use it, I get the best performance out of it. And speed pack's a great way to do that. So let me go ahead and show you how to create a speed pack and what a speed pack can do for you. Um, all right, here I've activated an existing speed pack, and I'll show you how to make this. But as I move my cursor around, you'll notice a lot of it is hidden as my cursor gets over the geometry. So the stuff that remains, that's actually what's loaded into memory. Everything else is just kind of graphical trickery that's there to show people that it's, it's, it's around, but it's really not thinking about it. That's how we save all that performance. Hey, Tim, real quick on that subject, uh, that, that graphic circle, I know that uh, it's useful for figuring out what is actually loaded and what isn't, but in, in many cases, I've been asked how to, to toggle that off. Would you mind showing that? Yeah, you bet. I, I like to hide it too. That way nobody knows you know, that, that I'm, yeah, I'm using some smart moves to exactly. simplify things. So I like to come up here to that command search that you talked about earlier and type in speed pack and then just, just turn it off. That's how I do it. Okay. Is there a better uh, way? Yes, one other suggestion. You know coming from me, it's going to be a keyboard shortcut. <laughs> if you hold down the Alt key and press S as in Sam, uh, it'll, it'll toggle that off. Or oh, very on. cool. Very cool. Thanks, yeah. Jacob. Sure. All right. Um, so to create a speed pack, you right-click an active configuration and you add a speed pack. Like I showed, I already have one. So let's go in and edit it and see what the ingredients look like. In here, you can select specific faces to preserve. For example, maybe I want these bottom feet around so I can mate that into place. Although, as I'll show you in a moment, I don't actually need that since I'm gonna use magnetic mates to snap this into place far faster than conventional mates. We can also select bodies to preserve. So I don't know, maybe for some reason I wanna run interference detection on this motor, I could select it and that'll stick around. I'm not going to because I wanna 
extreme performance here, so I'm going to remove that. You also have the opportunity to add reference geometry, planes, axes, sketches, curves, or these published references that uh, allow us to use these magnetic mates. So let's go ahead and check this out. There's also some other ways to um, exclude or include different components. This is how I used it, so I'm just going to show you that. And just like that, was that Alt S? Yeah. See what we've got. There you go. Now, um, magnetic mates. Magnetic mates are something that were added a few years ago and really speed up placing components. Let me show you the ingredients to that. Here we have a plane, and that's going to snap to another ground reference plane that I've got set up in the assembly. And then I've got a number of connector points on here, and as I drag one point over another, they'll be magnetically attracted and just snap together as I let go of my mouse. So the speed pack and magnetic mates allows me to work in the lightest weight version of that assembly and snap it together in, in record time. Let me show you how. Let's go back to the assembly here. And we'll add a little bit more to our conveyor over here. Here I've got a curved conveyor. Let's grab that. Now I'm just holding down control, the control drag out a copy. And then as that moves into the graphics, it's snapped to the ground plane. And as I get these points near one another, and let go of my mouse, they just snap together. So here's our um, you know, four meter conveyor, and drag that in. And then as I move that over different control points, you see how that can inference and allow me to snap into different orientations. Hey, real quick, Tim, um, that seems like some pretty nice behavior, but I did have one question about that because sometimes when I use magnetic mates, I struggle to get the proper connector. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a way to cycle between them. You bet, you actually. Pick? At the bottom of my screen, it shows this um, hotkeys for cycling connection points. So it's the square brackets. So here oh, I can nice. go around okay. here and choose which is the right one. Once I get the preview, I let go of the mouse, and it just snaps into position. So you can see how quickly uh, those magnetic mates can speed up the process of creating assemblies. Yeah, fun. definitely. That's a fun one to use. Okay, so let's recap. I showed you some of the typical symptoms and causes. Those are load or save delays, rebuild or display performance. We talked about some of the different diagnostic tools. Specifically, we spent a lot of time looking at the performance evaluation, which would be my recommendation to um, locate and identify the cause of those slowdowns. And then lastly, I showed you a number of performance enhancing modes, as well as some other tips along the way that should allow you to reclaim that performance without doing too much work. Really nice section, Tim. Uh, we do have some questions. So uh, the first one has to do with speed pack configurations, if you wouldn't mind talking about those a bit more. Uh, the question is, when you have a top level assembly and you've been, let's say you've been creating sub assemblies that have speed pack configurations, is there any way to automatically force the top level to reference those or do we have to do it just manually? Okay, I, I think I can answer this. So yeah, here's our four millimeter conveyor. And certainly I can select on it and choose that default speed pack. This is actually the kind of the default naming behavior is to append the configuration name with underscore speed pack. So now that I know that, and if I've been consistent with it, I can leverage this really cool open trick to one, create a configuration and two, make it reference my speed pack configuration or any others for that matter. So you'll select on the component. Here's that lightweight. Uh, option that was asked earlier. If you're in the PDM vault, this will still be here. No problems. Then what I'll do is I'll use this configuration. Now, instead of selecting a configuration, I'll use advanced. This is going to prompt me, and one of the ways I can use this is to define a new configuration. So let's call this uh, light speed because that's how fast it's going to operate. And then we'll tell it I want to call out a specific configuration called default underscore speed pack. And that's it. So that will open the assembly, go through each component, it asks the question, do you have this configuration? And if it does, it toggles it on. So this is probably the highest performance that we could make this assembly because much of it isn't loaded into memory. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I love that dialogue too. I'm glad you showed that. I hadn't even thought of it because I've used that dialogue for opening configurations and create them, creating them like you did there, but I hadn't considered using it to toggle speed pack. So I do appreciate that. Oh, you bet. Any other questions that we see? Tim, I know we had a question on another one on speed packs, but it's in regards to updating them. Because um, I know oh. back in the day, you had to kind of crawl through each file, open each one, update it. Uh, is there a better way to do that now? 
That's right. So for those of you who haven't run into that uh, in the past, uh, speed pack is a derived configuration. So if I make changes to the parent, in order to update to the derived configuration, you used to do this manually by going into that file and actually updating it. But uh, shortly after the release of Speedpack, SolidWorks saw the need and, uh, and added this option that I can get at by right-clicking at the top of the tree and selecting to update all Speedpack. Now that's probably something you wanna do before you head out for lunch. It could take a little bit of time, but it's certainly better than me going through and updating each and every one of those Speedpack configurations. So that's a great question. Just right-click at the top, of your top level assembly speed pack options and update them globally. Very nice. Hey, one other thing coming out of chat that's worth mentioning. This is from AR Hockey. Uh, speed pack configurations do retain the full bill of materials. So you don't have to worry about components disappearing out of, out of a bomb in, in drawings or in assemblies if that's where you keep track of your those materials. So Oh, that's good. That, yeah. So even if you've yeah. if you've removed those components, the bill of materials is still correct. Right, even if they're represented as graphics. Oh, Good call awesome. there. Appreciate that. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so my three top uh, tips you should have known were symptoms and causes of rebuild performance, diagnostic tools, and performance enhancing modes. Ryan, you covered uh, importing, diagnostics, and repairing import models, as well as direct editing tools that I was kind of shocked all the things you could do. Jacob, you had uh, what? You had user interface tips and tricks, mm -hmm. um, uh, display states, and configurations. So that's only nine. And that brings us to the last uh, tip that we have for you, and that's to leverage us. You know, we really strive to be your trusted solution partner. We have over 220 employees, and you know, there's a wealth of knowledge in uh, in those employees. It, it's our biggest asset by far. So, you know, if you're looking to solve some challenging question, ask us. You know, we may have already heard that question before and know of an answer or a solution to help you get there. At Hawkridge, we help customers a number of different ways. We have a very wide portfolio of products, of solutions in terms of software. There's the support team that uh, provides the best support in the industry, I believe, through a number of different modern ways we can get your questions answered. We have a whole slew of 3D printing. In fact, I'm here in the 3D printing lab. Behind me is a metal 3D printer, and over here is an HP uh, multi-jet fusion that makes some of the coolest plastic parts. I can't believe what time we live in that this stuff's possible. You know, We sell 3D scanners that can help you reverse engineer as well as some software that can go along with it. Now training, Jacob, that's something you do all the time. So I'd like you to talk to the group a little bit about some of the training offerings and, and what's all possible there. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. You know, training is one of my favorite parts of the job. Uh, you know, I, I learned so much from my students and I, I like to think that they learn just as much from me, but I don't know sometimes. Um, you know, we at Hawkridge, deliver some of the best SolidWorks content in the world. And we do this in a number of different ways. So we have different delivery methods according to your learning style. So in this case, all of our trainings being currently hosted online, uh, considering our current situation. But that being said, we hope to be resuming in-person classes here shortly within the next few months, ideally. And we have locations all over the country. So there's a good chance that you could come see me or Ryan in person if you'd ever like to. Uh, we also provide you with SolidWorks access. So even if you don't have a license, maybe you're looking to get a job designing with SolidWorks, you can come see us and we'll get you ready to go with all the skills and tools and techniques that you need to be successful. Um, and then in addition to that, in, in with respect to the types of courses that we offer and the number, we cover just about everything. In fact, I wanna say nearly everything that you've seen today is going to be covered in at least one of our classes, if not multiple. And we also offer training packages that bundle these classes together. The majority of our students are typically repeat customers. Very few people come and just take one class from us. So you can get up to nine classes for one low price and you can come see us multiple times. So I love our training, uh, our certification program for SolidWorks, right? Our training helps you get set up for that. In fact, I even had one student who went on to become an applications engineer like us. So that's my success story and uh, would love to see you guys sometime. Uh, right. And those are click, click along lessons, right? You, the, I know it, I've, I've done a lot of training. It's a rewarding and, and fun experience, but we're actually walking people through the very steps. So unlike this, where we're kind of talking to you, you're clicking right along with us, following each and every step along the way. Yeah, and for those who do prefer, uh, I think the, the click along style is pretty awesome, but we do offer self-paced content as well. So if you do prefer to work at your own speed and just you know kind of take some training here and there, we do offer those programs as well. Great. 
Yeah, just to put another good word in on the training too, this is Ryan here as as somebody who does a ton of that online training. Uh, it's it's interactive with the instructor, like we mentioned, and would we'll do screen sharing, even take a look at your screen and see if you get stuck on anything. So definitely consider it. I just want to remind everyone about this downloadable guide. It's actually grown since the slide you see on the screen here. Uh, this is basically like a written version of this presentation, and we actually put quite a bit of effort into it. So uh, down in the video description, there's a link. It's a second link in there. Uh, brings you to a page. You got to fill out your info. You'll get an email with this uh, download link to this PDF if you want to access it. And it really goes over almost everything we covered. And it even has links for more resources for videos and articles if you want to learn more about any of these topics. Right. I know we put a lot into this session. Um, you know, I think our goal was to give you as much as possible. But with that, you know, comes a trade-off in what you can all retain. So this guide is just a great way to go out there, you know, revisit what we're doing here. This will also be posted, so the recording will be around. If you care to watch this again, um, it'll be there. So here at Hawk Ridge, we really offer a wide range of tools and, and services, both software, hardware, and, and service kinds of stuff that cover all phases of the development cycle, whether that's design and things like CAD tools or management tools for getting more out of your data, or the simulation suite of products that allow things like, you know, design analysis concurrently with the design process built right into your CAD tool or very high-end sophisticated simulation tools that get into, you know, fracture mechanics or electromagnetics kinds of things. Pretty advanced stuff there, as well as a full suite of, design, of manufacturing tools, whether that's conventional, you know, subtractive manufacturing, like the CNC tools that are within CamWorks and SolidWorks Cam, or digital manufacturing solutions like the HP uh, and the Mark Forge as well as those scanners and a number of complementary tools and all of the different training and services that go along with that. Now, if you're in the, interested in these kinds of things right now, this month is a very important month for us and there are some promotions going on. Um, so not to get too salesy on you, but let us know if there's something that you think um, you'd be interested in. It's a great time to investigate these tools. So guys, um, I gotta tell you, this was one of the more fun days and I really didn't think it could get much more much better than what we did last fall with our conferences. But you know, there we only had like 200 people at a time. Here we had, I think I looked down and it was almost 600. It could have been more. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Tim, I just wanted to say thanks for, for putting this together and giving us the opportunity. I've had a, a really great time participating here. And a big shout out and thank you to all of our viewers. We really appreciate you attending. You know, we get a lot of ideas for our content from you guys. Uh, we've already had some feedback on, you know, future webinars and future live streams that people would like to see. Dana mentioned uh, potentially running something on circuit work sometime. Uh, Patrick mentioned generative design. So thank you for that feedback. And we do encourage you. Any ideas you have, we would love to hear them. Yeah, we'd love if you put in some ideas for future um, presentations right in the chat, or if you're watching this in the future down in the comments, we like to review that kind of stuff. And, and you know, the conversations back and forth can be really beneficial. Yeah, and I, again, I just want to say I was excited to be here. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. And uh, let us know what you thought of this event, again, in the chat or the comments. And uh, also let us know what type of content you want to see in the future, more live streams like this and topics to discuss, and uh, we'll, we'll go at it. Yeah, it could yeah. be live modeling. I like simulation yeah. stuff, just to give you a few ideas. I can see some chat things are coming in, so let's hope yeah. those are great ideas for next time. But yeah, Ryan... Jacob, thanks so much for your hard work. I know this was uh, you know, a lot of preparation and it was great content. I hope the viewers enjoy it as much as I did. And also to Nick over here off camera for producing all of this. He's done a fantastic job of, of helping us put this all together. Definitely. Thanks, yeah, guys. There's a, there's a prize too, right, Tim? Yes, sir, there is. Yes. So with that, um, we're gonna take all registrants and we're gonna put them into a hat. We're gonna pull a winner out for that 3D connection space mouse. So if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and go down to the description, click the registration and enter your information and you'll be eligible for that prize. But I really want to thank everyone for watching this uh, here at Hawkery Systems. This was our first live stream and I think we're going to do a lot more. I know I had fun and I hope you had as much fun as well. So thanks for joining. This is Tim. We'll see you next time.